So a possibly major legal development, one that could put Donald Trump in civil jeopardy for the January 6th insurrection. A federal judge is challenging Trump's claim of immunity from allegations that he incited the violent attack on the U.S. Capitol. Trump's attorneys tried to toss out the lawsuit, seeking to hold Trump and his allies accountable for violence on January 6th. During the hearing, Judge Mitt Meta said, quote, the words are hard to walk back. You have an almost two-hour window where the president does not say stop, get out of the Capitol. This is not what I wanted you to do. What do I do about the fact the president didn't denounce the conduct immediately and sent a tweet that arguably exacerbated things? Isn't that, from a plausibility standpoint, that the president plausibly agreed with the conduct of the people inside the Capitol that day? Joining us now, CNN chief legal analyst and former federal prosecutor Jeffrey Tubin. Jeff, this deals with civil cases, but the federal judge there just seemed to lean in hard to the questions we're hearing from some Democrats on the January 6th committee, which is dereliction of duty, which is why didn't the president try to stop this? You know, Berman, this is a really profound issue that has resonance beyond just the civil context, which is what is what does the job of president of the United States mean? And what can you do and what can't you do? Because obviously, as president, you have freedom of speech. You can say, you know, we're going to fight. We're going to fight for this cause or that cause. But when does that tip over the line into something that the legal system can punish you for? And that's really what the judge uh, was trying to weigh yesterday. And, you know, the, the question of, you know, did Donald Trump incite, encourage, support the, the rioters is, is central to this civil case, but it's also central to the criminal investigation. And that's the, that's the initial issue uh, that Judge Mehta in the, in the civil case is deciding, but it's also relevant to the federal prosecutors who were looking at the, at the event from a criminal perspective as well. And it sounds like the judge here is considering that question, did Donald Trump incite the rioters to be answered by his behavior afterward, which is that he really didn't do anything to stop it and that that may essentially be condoning it. Does that hold water? Well, that's that's um, one of that's the theory that he's looking at. And, you know, the initial question he's looking at is whether to dismiss the case uh, at the outset. But it's also worth remembering, and, I, and sometimes I think we don't focus on this enough, is that we act as if we know the totality of what Donald Trump did on January 6th and what he did in the events leading up to January 6th. We don't. We haven't heard any testimony so far about what Donald Trump was doing in the three hours before he um, he he issued that very tepid uh, d d request for the rioters to stop. I mean, there is a lot more we don't know, and uh, it could make the situation worse for Donald Trump. It could make it better, but um, the this issue of where what Donald Trump did and whether it was encouraging or participating in illegal activities. This is front and center in this case, and it will be in the criminal investigation as well. We don't know. The January 6th committee might, and they may be learning more about this each and every day, and they could learn a whole lot more if the Supreme Court opens up the National Archives, which they still have to weigh in on. Laura, the judge is raising the key question if you want a gateway and allow these civil suits to go forward. Can you plausibly make the case that Donald Trump is at least partially responsible? I mean, that two-hour window of time in which the president had the authority to act, and we still don't yet know what he, in fact, was doing. Remember, he's been fighting it tooth and nail all the way to the Supreme Court at this point, hoping that he will be excused from having to provide, or the National Archives will as well. But the idea of plausibility is really the key word here in the judge's consideration, John, thinking, would it really be a stretch to believe that the president of the United States was doing nothing when we have indication that, in fact, he was not doing all that he could to actually try to stop it, including the bare minimum of a tweet, the bare minimum of not essentially going along with it and just being very vocal and adamant about his true position if he, in fact, did not want this to take place. And so the judge's questions really raise a bigger issue about if that's the case, if it's not a stretch to actually wonder if he, in fact, was culpable, then 
Would it be too far of a stretch to allow him to have immunity and evade all liability? Uh, that, that, those are civil suits. So the standard is one there, as you know better than I do. Separate standard when you come to criminal cases, which is why this line in the New York Times today jumped out at me. I want to read it to you. In plea negotiations, federal prosecutors recently began asking defense lawyers for some of those charged in January 6th cases whether their clients would admit in sworn statements that they stormed the Capitol believing that Mr. Trump wanted them to stop Mr. Pence from certifying the election. In theory, such statements could help connect the violence at the Capitol directly to Mr. Trump's demands that Mr. Pence help him stave off his defeat. So let me ask the question. Does the Justice Department use case A, B, and C to effectively build case D? Meaning, if you get several people to say, I did this because Trump wanted me to do it, does that give you a stronger case to ultimately build a criminal case against the former president of the United States? It gives you a stronger case in a civil case, which, of course, the Department of Justice also can overlook as well and think about these cases. But remember, just because somebody says, I acted because I believed, is not going to be the straightest line of somebody saying, I instructed and I expected compliance. These are very different realms of possibility here. And so it can buttress the argument that these people were not spontaneously or coincidentally all thinking the same thing and, and dreaming up and conjuring up a directive. They can also help to think about this is what Trump actually wanted, but there's not the same, you know, um, vigor and the same ability to say if the person has instructed, it's a much more clear case here. But I give you the idea of liability in general here. It's not a clear issue right now for the court whether the, a, a president during the time of his tenure could be held civilly liable for behavior that he presently claims was in accordance with the official duties. Now, we believe, of course, in thinking about this objectively, that the actions of a president who were encouraging an insurrection could not possibly be in furtherance of an official duty. But the argument he's making right now is an attempt to say, look, I am shielded by virtue of the fact that I was the president at the time and I cannot be held accountable. I was just being the president. Sue me, you cannot. So, so, so a person who knows a lot, a person who knows a lot about the president's mindset heading up to that day, and the person who knows a lot and was at risk because of the president's inaction for those two plus three hours uh, that day is the former vice president, Mike Pence. There have been a lot of stories in recent days, including new ones today, about whether Pence will voluntarily cooperate and give an interview to the committee. Uh, from a public standpoint, from a trust of the republic standpoint, I think it would be critical to get Mike Pence on the record. From a legal standpoint, whether we're talking about these civil suits or potential criminal cases, how important is direct under oath testimony from a man who knows a hell of a lot? It's critical, and not just for the transparency of the public sake, John, but also from this notion of it is the direct evidence, the direct evidence you would need. Remember, talking around the issue, and maybe he hoped that his own chief of staff or other people in his camp would provide the testimony and have his fingerprints off, but there will be nothing like getting from the proverbial horse's mouth, not to call Pence a horse, I'm talking about the figurative phrase alone, people out there, the idea of hearing it from him directly, the person who, for whom the gallows were built, talk about for whom the bell tolls, for whom the gallows were built, John, not to mention, I want to know, was there a call made from the vice president to the president of the United States asking for help? What was the reaction? How were you rebuffed? How was it advanced? What actually happened? That can only really come from the gravity of the vice president of the United States. One of the many giant questions as we move into the next phase of the committee's work. Laura Coates, grateful uh, for the important insights. Thank you so much.